Hello, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in Zechariah. This is going to be chapter 9 that we're going to do. So let's get started. Get your King James Bible and put it out. And turn it open to Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach and Damascus shall be the rest thereof. When the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord. As of all the tribes of Israel shall be toward the Lord. And Hamath, or is it Hamath, also shall border thereby Tyrus and Zidon, though it be very wise. Now, Tyre and Zidon, some people uh, say that they were descendants of Dan. Others say they were the Canaanites. Some say they were the mix, mixed up of both. Some of Dan, some of Fa uh, Canaanites. Uh, but they also call themselves the Phoenicians. And uh, it's quite possible because Dan, uh, according to history and legend, uh, they went to northern Europe and they were the descendants of the Vikings. The tribe of Dan was very, very capable with ships. And uh, so were the, uh, the Vikings. And so were the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were uh, traders. They would travel all over. And, uh, and then uh, trade things, and they got wealthy. And uh, so this is why in verse 3, And Tyrus did build herself a stronghold, and heaped up silver as the dust, and fine gold as the mire, of the streets. Now, Tyrus, uh, if I remember correctly, was uh, had a stronghold on the island, an island, and uh, Alexander the Great. They basically he asked them to surrender, and they wouldn't, and they thought they were safe on their little island not far off the coast. Well, basically, Alexander had his army. Uh, pick up rocks and start throwing them over at the seashore. And basically, he built a bridge <laughs> out of stones. He just, you know, uh, and uh, they basically destroyed it with fire. They burned it, you know. Alexander, uh, he didn't play. Alexander the Great. Now, everybody will try to tell you that, well, you know, Jesus' real name is, is Yeshua, and, and that, that's, that's a Hebrew name, and his family were Hebrews, and they spoke Hebrew. i tell you what, people. Alexander the Great conquered Egypt. He conquered the land of Israel. He conquered uh, large parts of the Mediterranean, uh, you know, Greece, all the way to parts of India and parts of Europe. Uh, Alexander the Great conquered a huge area, absolutely huge. Uh, they didn't call him great because he was a, a godly man. They called him Alexander the Great because he was a great conqueror. But uh, he conquered the area. And let me tell you something. When you conquer an area, that area is going to learn your language. Now, those people will tell you, well, he was a Macedonian, and they're not really Greeks. What? They live right next to Greece. They spoke Greek. I mean, you know, that's like somebody in, uh, you know, somebody in Florida uh, and somebody in Georgia, I mean, they look the same. They speak the same language. Well, basically, with a southern drawl, right? And um, and then you're going to tell me they're not Americans because they live in a different area, state? Really? 
But uh, that's, that's the kind of junk that they come up with. But the thing was, Greece was conquered by Rome only recently uh, when uh, during the, in the land of Israel during that time period, Rome had only recently conquered that area. I mean, if, if you were uh, com conducting commercial business, you had better know Greek because that was the common language of the day. Now, if you went to the courts during the time of Christ, you better know Latin because that was the official uh, language of the government. But the thing was, almost all those people knew Greek. I mean, let's face it, it was just the, the common language. And the thing is, when Pilate put the sign above Jesus, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, it was in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. And I bet you he did that in Hebrew just to, uh, I guess you could say, uh, upset the, uh, the priests. And they weren't Catholic priests, sorry. So, but uh, Tyrus, Alexander the Great, uh, destroyed Tyrus, absolutely destroyed it. You know, they thought they were safe on their little island, but uh, Alexander took, uh, just, he built a bridge out of rocks. So, verse 3, And Tyrus did build herself a stronghold and heaped up silver as the dust and fine gold as the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out and he will smite her power in the sea and she shall be devoured with fire. Ah, here we go. Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron for her expectation for her expectation shall be ashamed, shall be ashamed, and the king shall perish from Gaza or Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. All right, so what are they talking about here? Ashkelon, Gaza, you know, what are they talking about? Well, and Ekron. Well, let's take a look a little bit. But uh, these pertain to the peoples of the Canaanites. All right, let's take a look at Ekron. Uh, Joshua 13.3. I'm going to skip around a little bit, but just to give you an idea. From Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron, northward, which is counted to the Canaanite. Five lords of the Philistines. All right. Uh, Goliath that taunted Israel, that King David, future King David slew, he was a Philistine. He was one of the giants. Five lords of the Philistines. The, uh, the Gazathites. Oh, these people live in Gaza. G-A-Z-A, -A, Gaza. Gaza, Gaza. The Gazathites. And the Ashdathites, the Eshkelonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, also the Ivites. All right, so what else do we have? All right, let's take a look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 1. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now, Ahab uh, was the king of northern Israel. Their capital was in Samaria. He was married to a lovely lady named Jezebel. And uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but it said, And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord to anger than all all the kings of Israel that were before him. Ahab was bad news bears, and God was not happy with him. And uh, wasn't happy with uh, Jezebel either. 
So, so verse 2, And Ahaziah fell through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria. Now, that was the capital of northern Israel. And was sick, and he sent his messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baal-zebub, B-A-A-L is the name of the false god. It means uh, basically Lord, and had been associated with Satanism so badly. Actually, God said, don't call me that anymore. I mean, it, it's just a generic word for Lord. But uh, they were calling the devil Lord. At, uh, the God of Israel said, eh, don't call me that anymore. So he said, so the king of Israel, ah Ahaziah, you know, he fell down, and I guess he was in bad in a bad way. Uh, so he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whither I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord send unto to Elijah the Tishbite, my favorite prophet of the Old Testament, Elijah, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. Now, check this out. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 22, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, Now, here it is. Jesus is doing miracles, right? He hath Beelzebub. They're basically saying he's got the devil, the god of the Ek Ekron. He hath Beelzebub. And by the prince of the devils, Casteth he out devils. So basically, they're accusing Jesus of casting out the devils by the power of the devil. And if you want to keep reading this, you can. But uh, this is the unpardonable sin. This is the unpardonable sin, attributing the work of of the Holy Spirit to the work of the devil. And guess what, people? When you read a certain group of people that meet in the sin of Gog, um, they teach this. They actually teach this. People wonder why they present the gospel to them and they can't hear it. This is why. The unpardonable sin. They actually teach that Jesus performed his miracles by the power of the devil. So, all right, so let's see. All right, so uh, let's Ekron. Let's take a look at Ashkelon. All right, let's read the book of Joshua, chapter 11, verse 15. Now, you know, you'd never know it listening to the uh, so-called messianics but uh, Yeshua and Joshua is the same word and honestly I think they mispronounce these words so that you don't make a word association which is what the New Testament Bible I mean the uh, the new Bible versions do they change the words that you so that you don't make word associations with uh, oh so that you don't catch something something in the Old Testament that would explain the New Testament, like a phrase or a word. They'll change it so that you don't catch the connection between it. You know, it's just like uh, Salem and Shalom. Means a, uh, Salem means peace. But uh, you're talking about Yiddish, uh, the Yiddish speakers from Eastern Europe. You know, they want you to think that Yiddish is Hebrew. It's not. Yiddish is not Hebrew. I can take a Hebrew Old Testament 
put it in front of their face, and the alphabet looks the same, but it's not. They can't read it. They don't. They can't translate it. It's not the same, people. You know, that, and then they mispronounce the words. Salem, it's Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. Uh, you know, it's not Jeru Shalom. No, but they but they do that so you you don't make the association. Same thing with Yeshua and Joshua. I think it's Joshua. But uh, what can I tell you? All right, Joshua eleven fifteen. And the Lord commanded Moses his servant. So did Moses command Joshua. And so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took all that land, the hill and all the south country and all the land of Goshen and the valley and the plain and the mountain of Israel and the valley of the same. Even from Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal Gad, hmm, B-A-A-L, G-A-D, Baal, there's that word Baal again, Lord, in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon. You know, according to the Book of Enoch, which I'm not real thrilled about the Book of Enoch, but uh, according to the Book of Enoch, uh, Mount Hermon is where the fallen angels made their pact that they would... Um, intermarry with the human women and have these giants for children. So I find it interesting that Mount Hermon is mentioned here. And Mount Hermon is right in the middle of the territory of the Canaanites. So what can I tell you? All right, so Joshua sent the army, uh, even on even from the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, unto Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took and smote them and slew them. You know, the thing is, you listen to the modern churches and they'll tell you, well, you know, the Canaanites were, well, they just weren't nice people. And, you know, that's why the Lord said to destroy them. But but now Jesus, he, he, we got a different God in the New Testament than the Old Testament. And Jesus is just, he's just so loving and kind. And, and he changed his mind and now he wants the Canaanites to be uh, saved. And that's the kind of stuff they teach. But, you know, God told them, exterminate the Canaanites. Kill them. All of them. And Jesus is such a kind soul that he's going to destroy the world in fire. Those that reject his gift of eternal life by his shed blood. Yeah, that's, that's the loving kindness uh, that they don't understand. He, he suffered and died on a cross that all you had to do was believe that he did that and rose from the dead, and that's it. But the, uh, but the goats don't want to believe that. Verse 18. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All other they took in battle, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly. Huh. That he might destroy them utterly and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims, the Anakims, from the mountains, from Hebron, from Dibur, unto Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and all the uh, mountains of Israel, Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. The Anakims were giants, people, just like the, the Philistines. There were none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza and in Gath and in Ashdod there remained. 
And Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance, inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. Now, I don't know how many of you are um, Star Wars people. Now, I find it interesting, like, uh, I used to be a big Star Trek fan when I was a kid. We used to watch it, you know, I was real young. But I used to watch the original series uh, in the 60s. Yeah, I'm old. And um, when I got older and started studying the Bible, I noticed there were quite a few Bible references in Star Trek. Not good ones, but uh, in Star Wars... Uh, Darth Vader, one of the evil ones, uh, his name, prior to being it, being having it been changed to Darth Vader, was Anakim. And Anakims, in the Bible, perhaps are spelled a little differently, I don't know. But uh, they were associated with the giants, and not a good thing. Uh, let's see. All right. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. The Emims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. Huh. So they were tied in with the giants. All right. All right, let's go back to Zechariah. Verse 6. And a bastard. Oh, no, I'm not cussing. This is actually a Bible word, bastard. When you look it up in the Hebrew, it means a mixed mongrel a mixed mongrel that's what it means a bastard and a bastard shall dwell in ashdod and i will cut off the pride of the philistines uh, ashdod was a place where the Phil uh, canaanites lived and the philistines were the giants the satanic fallen angel human hybrids you know think goliath he was a philistine god calls them bastard or bastards and the modern usage of the word means oh you know you don't have a uh, your, your your father ran away your mom and dad uh, your 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 dad didn't marry your mom and he ran off now you got a single mom well that's not the original meaning of the word but that's what it means now i mean let's face it uh back in the old days a sodomite was a sodomite and a person that was gay was happy. Now, somebody that's gay is a sodomite. So the word meanings have changed. God's word doesn't change, but the English language might change, but God's word does not change. Verse 7. And I will take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. Now, from what I understand, the word cannibal comes from the word Canaan, which was the father of the Canaanites and the Philistines, and Baal, or Baal, B-A-A-L, which uh, was a generic word for Lord, which came associated to Satanism. So, Canaan and Baal, Canaan Baal, cannibal. So maybe that's what they're talking away, uh, talking about here. And I will take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. Now, according to legend, the Canaanites were cannibals. Now, in Africa, among the Aztecs and the Incas, uh, there was uh, the tribes that were cannibals they had a thing that if you killed your enemy and ate 
ate him that you gained his strength. So cannibalism is not a new thing. It's an old thing. And uh, like I mentioned before, some of the American Indian tribes were cannibals too. And that's why um, the Christians grabbed their rifles instead of a salt shaker. So, and I will take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. But he that remaineth, even he shall be for our God, and he shall be as a governor in Judah, and Ekron as a Jebusite. And I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth. And no oppressor shall pass through them any more, for now have I seen with mine eyes. Listen carefully, people. Here's a, a messianic prophecy right here, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Now, the, um, the word salvation, um, believe it or not, is also tied in with that word Joshua. So, thy king cometh unto thee, he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Where else do we read that? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Ah. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a great multitude spread their garments, garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. Oh boy. <laughs> I love it. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sought, sold, and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. You know what? Jesus could go to any, most any church today and, and do the same thing. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David! They were sore displeased. Oh yeah, they were unhappy. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? Oh yeah. Back to verse 9. Zechariah 9.9, 9, 
Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Yeah, you ever hear a preacher tell you, oh, well, you know, don't read that Old Testament. That's, that's only for the Jews, and, and, and we're not Jews, and, and we're in a different dispensation. You know, that was the dispensation of law, and, and, and we're in the dispensation of grace, and this is the church age, and you don't want to read that Old Testament. You'll just get confused. I don't get confused. Maybe they're confused. I'm not that confused. I mean, I'm not going to say I understand it perfectly. I don't. But um, actually, they don't want you to get confused because you'll not understand the lies that they're teaching. And when you start asking questions that they can't answer with their theology, uh, you ask too many questions, you'll be told not to come back to church anymore. Especially you ask those questions in a Bible study in front of people. Oh boy, they'll kick you out. Trust me, I know. Verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and a battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water the blood of the covenant huh where have i read that before well in the book of exodus ah you thought i was going to the new testament wrong i like to throw you off every once in a while and moses uh exodus 24 and verse 8 and moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Ah, see, there's the blood of the covenant in the Old Testament. And what about in the New Testament? Let's take a look. Now, you knew I was going there. Come on. All right, let's go to Matthew 26. Now, the thing is, a covenant is sort of like a contract. It's an agreement. And it is valid as long as the persons are alive. And the only difference between a covenant and a testament is uh, you've heard of a last will and testament. Well, a testament doesn't come into effect until after the person's death. So keep that in mind. A covenant and a testament um, basically are the same thing, but a covenant's when you're alive and a testament is after you're dead. So, the Last Supper, Matthew chapter 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to the disciples and said, Take eat this is my body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many not all which is shed for many for the remission of sins all right let's go to the book of hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 now of the things which we have spoken this is the sum yeah you know that's a mathematical term you know when you get to the end of a, a problem well there's the sum we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesties majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary well, what's a sanctuary? It's a safe place. So Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. 
For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Okay. All right. So, for if he, Jesus, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow, the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. You know, if the first, if the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was was perfect, there'd have been no need for a new covenant. And uh, all these Hebrew roots people, these sacred name people, they won't, they don't believe in the new covenant. They believe in a renewed covenant. They want you to go back to the old covenant that didn't work the first time because we were sinless. We were, I'm sorry, we were. We were not sinless. What we were was sinful flesh. We were unable to keep the old covenant. That's why there's the new one. The old one was just a shadow of what was to come. But they want to take us back. They call it the renewed, the renewed covenant. Yeah, let's, it didn't work the first time, so let's try it again. Sort of like uh, communism. And socialism never worked in the past, and they want us to think it'll work this time. We got it. We'll, we'll get it to work this time. Yeah, wrong. Didn't work in the past, and it's not going to work in the future. All right. So, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Let's go back to verse six. But now hath he a obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, not a renewed covenant, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not the same, people. They're not the same. Israel and Judah were different. Different kings, different land areas, different capitals. They had wars against each other. All right, so in Hebrews 8.8, 8, I find that interesting. Uh, the Lord created everything in six days. The seventh day he rested. And then on the eighth day was uh, always a, a new beginning. You know, it was the beginning of a new week. Eight always points to a new beginning. So here we got Hebrews 8, chapter 8, verse 8. I, I, you know... The, uh, you know, the, some people will tell you that this is numerology and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you got to realize something. Everything that God makes is good, but Satan will try to corrupt it. So, they'll take something good like astronomy and then they'll turn it into astrology. Or, you know, numbers and scriptures... Number, certain numbers pop up over and over and over in the Bible. And um, I know about it, just like the colors. Um, I'm not an expert, but uh, I, I can see certain things pop up. But uh, Hebrews 8.8, 8, 
for finding fault with them, the, co the old covenant, right? He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, where do we find that in the Bible? Uh, well, that's in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See, it's a good thing you don't read that Bible just like your preacher tells you. Don't read that Old Testament. You might get confused. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, if you get confused, it's because your preacher's lying to you. And he can't explain things because he doesn't have the truth or he's hiding the truth. One or the other, I don't know. Verse 9, Hebrews 8 and 9. All right, so God's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind not on tablets of stone like he did with Moses, the Ten Commandments. And I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Praise the Lord for that. And their sins and their iniquity, iniquities will I remember no more. I'm so glad that God's going to be forgetful. In that he saith, a new covenant, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So if the Hebrew roots people want to renew the covenant and go back and build a temple and start doing animal sacrifices, go for it. But I'm not going to have anything to do with it. So, Zechariah 9 and 11. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. And what's, what was the prisoners in the Old Testament? the people in hell and there's no water there's no water for those people alright so what is this pit well in Revelation 9 and verse 1 and the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit so this star is a hymn and was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Let's skip to verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, uh, why would they say in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon? Because, well, and then it tells you, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So, you know, if the thing was, if the New Testament was written in Hebrew, why would they tell you that his name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon? Because, I don't know. Of course, you can make the same argument with the Greek, uh, Polyon, you know. But, uh, you know, the, here it is, they translate it in both Hebrew and Greek. All right, the pit. All right, in the book of Ezekiel 31, verse 16. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. When I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. Ah, hell. 
when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. Ah. So, let's see. All right, so you get it. The pit is associated with hell. And, um, of course, there'll, there's people. There's three Bible words that are translated as hell. One of them is grave. And the Jehovah's false witnesses are famous for taking the, the first definition and saying, see, see, hell is just the grave, you know, and that's it. There, there's no fire. And then when you do show them uh, the second word, that's Gehenna, that's translated as fire, well, they'll tell you, well, that's the garbage dump that where they are always burning the trash. Mm. And then there's Tartarus, which is a Greek word, um, which is Hades, which is the deepest abode of hell, which is where the fallen angels were imprisoned. I think it's in the book of Jude, if I remember correctly. So let's take a look at something. Uh, let's go to Luke 16, verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores. Ah, well, let's go. Let me go back one. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Purple's royalty, people. He had nice clothing and he ate very well. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels. Carried by the angels. Do you know when you die, you're carried by the angels? And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now remember, Abraham was called the friend of God. The rich man also died and was buried and in, and in hell. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. See, there's no water in hell. He just wants, you know, the rich man just wants Abraham to, to have Lazarus to just dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, see, the rich man was a son of Abraham. Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, the pit, right? So that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Huh. So, you get the idea? All right, let's go back to Zechariah 9 and 11. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have set forth, sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. See, Christ, what Christ was doing for the three days, he was dead. Uh, in the flesh, anyways, he went down and preached to Abraham and to Lazarus and all the Old Testament saints and taught them about the new covenant, believe on him. They're not in Abraham's bosom anymore. They're not in, they're not down there anymore. They're gone. But the rich man, he's still there. 
verse 12. I did a Bible study on that if anybody's interested. Um, boy, I hope I could find it if somebody asked me because I'm not sure. Verse 12, turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. See, they were prisoners of hope. Oh, yeah. You know what? Let me tell you something. Salvation was mentioned in the Bible as early as Genesis chapter 3 and in Job 19.25. Uh, there are a lot of scholars that will tell you that Job was the first book written in the Old Testament, first book written. I'm of that opinion too. I think it's older than Genesis, but, you know, it's just an opinion. Um there's a saying, you get two rabbis together and you'll get three opinions, at least. So Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Ah. Psalm 78.35, And they remembered that God was their rock. And the high God, their Redeemer. Isaiah 41, 14. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. In Isaiah 44, and verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. I am the first and I am the last. Huh. Now where have I read something about that before? Hmm. Let me think here. Oh yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 21 and verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to them I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now, didn't we just read in Zechariah in verse 11? As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. But guess what? In Revelation 21, 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning, beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the of the water of life freely. Ah. Revelation 22, 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Ah, yes. All right, let's go back to Zechariah 9, and verse 11. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Turn ye, turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Ah, you see, the prisoners that were in hell in the Old Testament, in Abraham's bosom, they had hope. They knew that one day the Messiah would come. Ye prisoners of hope, even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee when I have bent Judah for me Filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. Oh yeah, Greece was made the sword of a mighty man. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. Did you know that there were uh, the children of Judah in Greece? You didn't know that? 
Well, it's in the book of Joel, chapter 3. Let's take a look. Verse 1. Joel, chapter 3 and verse 1. Yeah, don't, you know, don't read that Old Testament. You'll get confused. That's only for the Jews. Remember that. That's what your pastors in your denominational churches will tell you. Trust me, I know. I've been to enough of them. I gave up looking for... All right, so, be, for behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon? Ah, remember we read about Tyre and Zidon earlier. And all the coasts of Palestine. Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me, Swiftly and speedily will I return your recompense upon your own head. In other words, uh, payback. Verse 5. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. Listen carefully. The children also of Judah... And the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. You see, the Tyre and Zidon, and they, uh, they took the children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem and sold them unto the Grecians. Just another word for the Greeks. You know, I mean, you know, you got America and the Americans. Well, the Grecians were Greeks. So there were children of Judah that were sold into slavery into, into Greece. So, verse 13 of Zechariah 9. When I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up my, uh, thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. You know what? Maybe that's why, um, that's why the New Testament was in Greek. Maybe a lot of the Greeks were uh, Judah. What do you think? What think ye? Verse 14. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. Remember in the book of Revelation, there's going to be seven trumps? Oh, yeah. And the Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine. And they shall be filled with bowls, and as the corners of the altar... And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine the maids. Well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the only begotten Son, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In his precious name, amen.